Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kirsten Conrad, who is our uh, extension agent and leader of our Master Gardener group. And she will be addressing um, the topic of soil health. Kirsten. Thank you so much, Colleen. And thank you to our team of ex excellent Master Gardeners today who are helping to facilitate today's presentation. And as Colleen mentioned to you, this presentation is being recorded. And um, if you wish to share, uh, to save the chat box, you can do so simply by clicking on the three little dots and um, saying save chat. And there'll be some information in the chat box for you about that. Um, but our team will be sharing with you resources in addition to in commentary uh, you know, that we teach in Master Gardener land. Um, about soil health, and, and um, you may wish to take advantage of, of the chat box feature. Um, I'm the extension agent for Arlington County in Virginia and the city of Alexandria. And uh, my program is Agriculture and Natural Resources. And it's been a real pleasure to be here for the last 14 years to help support the education of our residents and many others beyond our, our shores here, so to speak, um, on many aspects of sustainable landscape management. Today's presentation on soil health is an essential topic that not only gardeners, but everyone on this planet needs to be aware of. Um, as Virginia Cooperative Extension Director Ed Jones has told us, that we need to work to build and provide a sustainable food supply and adapt to a change in climate. Soil health and the management of soil is of critical importance to that effort. And there are many partners that are trying to come together to work on things like that, but we can all have a role to play in helping to address this important critical issue. I've often said that I can teach soil health to those who are interested in soil health, but many others in our communities are not concerned about soil health or the importance of maintaining healthy soils. And it's, frankly, it's difficult even for, for experienced gardeners to grasp. But when we equate soil health to plant health, and when we equate plant health to higher nutrition levels and higher nutrition levels to human health, then we can begin to have a conversation about why soil health is the foundation of everything that we need to do here. So this presentation today aims to start you down that road of understanding, and I hope that you will take away from it some important ideas about what you can do yourself. So here's the dirt on soil. Um, what's dirt, what's soil? Those terms are often used interchangeably, but if you will, I would like to propose to you that dirt is something that we throw away, that we clean up and sweep out of our houses and throw away. Soil, however, is something that we nurture and build and upon which we build our landscapes, our gardens, and indeed our very civilizations even. The late Tom Harvey, who some of you remember as a much loved radio presenter, is quoted in a program about the farmer's life. We owe our very existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. He wasn't too far off. This is what forms um, our plants around us, it supports our soil, it supports the food that we produce, it supports the plants that, that shade us, it supports the life that um, supports um, plant and animal health throughout our ecosystems. Soil is formed when rock is broken down by climate and by vegetation over a period of time. It is weathered rock fragments, it is decaying remains of plants and animals, organic matter that, that we both, that both grows naturally as well as what we add to it. Uh, and it contains differing amounts of air, water, and microorganisms. It also supply, supplies mechanical support and nutrients for growing plants, as you know. The USDA defines soil health as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So today I hope we can get through a few of these concepts. First of all, soil is often referred to by scientists as something called the Peterlith, P-E-D-L-L-I-T-H. 
The pedolith consists of a solid phase of minerals and organic matter, the soil matrix, if you will. Uh, it also includes in its description the porous phase. It holds the gases and the water um, in solution. We can and should think of soils as a three-state system of solids, liquids, and gases. In this photo, the soils that we usually garden in and think about in terms of our, our stuff that we are uh, coming in contact with on a regular basis generally consists of the top two to three layers. The O layer, um, which is considered the organic layer, that's the duff, the humus, the humus, the, the material at the top of the soil, which contains the majority of organic matter. The A level, um, which we think of as being the surface soil, and maybe sometimes we might get down into the subsoil, which is considered the B layer. Um, below that, we have the substratum, the C layer, and below that is the bedrock, okay, that from which all soils are based. We need good soil because a healthy living soil contains the organic matter that helps break down and hold salt, other contaminants like chemicals that are, we accidentally and intentionally <laughs> add to it, uh, and it holds them long enough for them to be taken up by plants, broken down by sunlight, or be dissipated by dilution and age. Healthy soil certainly helps to sustain plant growth with age and reducing the tendency of chemicals to leach through soil to grow groundwater. So healthy soil is an important way for our groundwater to be kept clean. Healthy soil has even been thought of as being a, um, a, a basic human right and an aspect of social justice even. The writer Tom Robbins puts it this way, dirt is the mother of lunch, mother of lunch. And soil is a product of several factors. To take them together, the influence of climate um, the elevation, the orientation, the slope of the terrain, organisms and the soil's plant structure can help, um, I'm sorry, can help great, provide the, the, the nature of soil and provide us with the micronutrients that identify each soil as being unique. So this is a, Sadly, a familiar look to what we would call urban soils. And here in Arlington and Alexandria, we are dealing with super urban soils. And thankfully, there are um, many people here who are concerned and across the country and across the world who are concerned about soil health and work to improve it. But of special interest to me is the profile of what has been called urban soils. Urban soils are sliced, diced, buried, baked, and generally treated with no more respect than if there were inanimate floors of asphalt, which of course is how it often ends up functioning in the landscape. Um, it is our job to change that reality and to mitigate that because the main threats of our urban soils and the degradation of urban soils is filtration of, our, of soil into our waterways, uh, the movement of soil particles and the tendency to erode is quite high in areas where soil is unhealthy. The runoff of phosphorus and other nutrient runoff is the major pollutant to our uh, watershed of the Chesapeake Bay. Insufficient organic matter um, is a significant hazard to the microorganisms that help support our plant growth. Um, without that organic matter that feeds the microorganisms in the soil, we cannot have effective, um, healthy plant growth. And certainly the aspect of non-local soils, the importation of soils that are not native to this area happens on a frequent basis. You know, when you have look at fill dirt, where does it come from? It looks completely different from what the soil here that was native. In short, we don't have a native soil. And that poses some issues for the reestablishment of native and um, ecosystem specific plantings that are so popular and necessary today. 
Open soils can be, but are not generally not very healthy soils. So let's talk about what, how we define a healthy soil a little bit more. Healthy soils um, provide an enhanced drainage mechanism and the need to provide permeability to rainwater as well as irrigation water um, is of great importance in our urban area with so much of that area covered by impermeable surfaces like asphalt, roadways, patios, sidewalks, and so on. The health of the few areas that are left um, is, is of great importance to taking in stormwater and, and the um, rainwater that comes to us <laughs> that we're lucky enough to get. In addition, the uh, effects of rainwater and the ever increasing effects of climate change, which is resulting in heavier rainfall, um, it, you know, washes away organic matter from the top layer, it removes um, soil and washes it into our waterways, and it also compacts the soil. So one of the important concepts that we need to do is keep soil covered on several layers, not only at the soil level with, um, with mulch, with ground cover plants, but also in the canopy level where we can cover it with, um, with a tree and shrub canopy that helps break up the effects of water. The lack of soil surface also reduces the ability of the soil to act as a sponge and complete the water cycle from the, from the atmospheric moisture down to our water tables. So without that, we have runoff problems and so on. Healthy soils help to maintain high populations of microorganisms as we talked about. And they enhance the nutrient holding capacity of soils. If we have very low organic matter in the soil. The soil nutrients are in uh, less abundance and the microorganisms that help make those nutrients available to plants are also in less abundance because they need the organic matter to feed on. Healthy soils also enhance the water holding capacity as we talked about, uh, as well as the drainage of water through the soils. Um, as you know, we have much, much um, uh, heavier rainfalls interspersed with, with long periods with no rain. Uh, so the ability of healthy soils and organic matter to mitigate that by providing a buffer to the variability in soil moisture um, levels um, allows um, uh, plants to withstand longer periods without water. Healthy soils also act as an anchor. They protect plants and soil microorganisms by stabilizing the soil and protecting them both from drastic changes to not only moisture levels, but also temperature, chemical composition, salt, and other contaminants. They also act as a physical anchor that plant roots hold onto to prevent wind damage, animal grazing damage, and of course, uprooting from flood events. Healthy soils are not compacted soils. They are loose soils. I once had a proponent of a gardening practice called double digging tell me that when and if the action of double digging was completed correctly, I should be able to push my hand down into the prepared soil up to my elbow. I remember thinking that I couldn't even drive a screwdriver into some of my soil. But just to say that the practice of double digging has now been discontinued as a best practice. The practice of double digging involves the inversion of soil layers, and it has now been seen that that is injurious to the microorganisms and the living components of soil that our plants depend on. But certainly loosening the soil with a broad fork or with a pitchfork or anything you can do to add organic layers, um, either through um, lasagna mulching or through simply covering the soil with organic matter like mulch will help to keep the um, um, soil loosened. So what is a good soil? 
Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that, but generally speaking, um, a good soil consists of about 50% solid material and 50% open pore space. And that open pore space is what's needed to hold the air and the water components of the soil. Most of these soil solids are mineral components um, that are made up of varying sizes. Um, everything from the, the, you know, the large pores, the large portions, the large uh, sizes of sand down to the very tiny microscopic particle sizes of clay. Under, but under ideal conditions, your soil should have about 50% air and water and about 50% mineral particles with only about 5% of that making up as organic matter. Yes, you can have more than that, but um, I have never been able to sustain organic matter level contents for a long period of time at higher levels. In fact, I should tell you that my father who lives in Ohio has a, um, a slab on which he places um, city um, leaf mulch that is dumped there. And every year he adds about six inches of leaf mulch to his garden. And it's leaf mold, right? Good stuff, right? Organic matter. And one year I went to him and he said, I can't figure out what's wrong with my garden. And it's so dry, it, it doesn't look good. When I went down to pick up the soil, it had no moisture in it. That leaf mulch was dry. It was not well integrated with the soil. And of course he tills his garden, he tillers, only get down about, at best, maybe 12 inches down into the soil. And of course, after many years, that was all leaf mulch on top. And I finally said to him, I said, you need to put some clay on here. He needed some mineral content to hold that um, moisture and to bind with the organic matter. And he did that and it improved it immensely. Essentially, his garden had gotten out of whack. And the mineral, mineral particles that he needed needed to be restored back to that 50% layer. So we talked about pore spaces and a pore space is nothing more than um, um, a, a, a gap between soil particles in which water and air space occupy, um, allow water to drain through and, um, and air to be provided for the actions of plant roots and microorganism health. Our soil is not just a collection of fine minerals, okay? Good soil is um, composed of soil aggregates. And these aggregates that are also called PETs contain the soil particles that contains water, contains um, you know, air spaces, and they're aggregated into these little clumps. And if you've ever worked in the soil, you've seen these little, little tiny clumps. It's not just little fine stuff, it's little clumps of soil. And these aggregates or pads form when mineral soils are weathered and organic plant materials are combined with it. Um, it's influenced by the ability of root growth and, and decaying um, plant material and organic matter in the soil. It's certainly helped along by um, the presence of living bacteria and fungi that bind the particles together. Uh, and also there are um, gelatinous organics like gums and resins and waxes that are produced by plants that help to cement the clay particles together into these pets. This is a good thing. And clay particles, and we don't, uh, we're gonna talk about this on the next slide, but clay particles are really, really tiny. And they're, they're, they're platy, they're, they're, they're flat, and they hold together, they, they bind very closely together. And when clay particles are broken up, that, that tendency to bind together uh, helps to create these pads. And in the example I just gave you about the uh, heavily organic soils, that clay was absent, and so that the organic material had nothing holding it together. The, um, Clay particles um, are the tiniest of all soil particles. And when you have a heavy clay soil, those particles adhere to each other so tightly that the water that's in between the soil particles is not available to plants. We'll talk about that some more as we go along. 
So the particle sizes matter a lot. Okay, if a sand particle, um, if your soil is mostly sand, um, you're going to have a soil which drains very quickly, but doesn't hold a lot of water. If your soil is mostly clay, you're gonna have a soil which um, holds a lot of water, but doesn't drain quickly because those clay particles are holding it so closely. And what I want you to do is become very intimately familiar with your soil. What is your soil like in your garden? You can go out and touch your soil, feel it, get in your soil, dig up a load of soil, smell it. Um, there are farmers who suggest that you should taste your soil even. Um, and uh, the, old, the old farmer's tale was you could tell whether a soil was sweet or basic or sour and acid simply by tasting it. I'm not advising that today. But I do suggest that you can know your soil by feeling the tiny particles between your fingers. So just for fun, what would a sandy soil feel like? Think about the words that you would use to describe a sandy soil. I would suggest that a sandy soil would feel gritty. Okay, it's going to, you're gonna actually feel the different part, components of the sand between your fingers. What about silt, a silt soil? Silt is the next, um, largest particle um, and it's pretty small compared to sand, but still it is larger than clay. On a silt soil or a silt particle, it's going to feel something in between, something less than gritty. I'm gonna suggest that I would suggest that the salt, silt soil feels smooth. When you, when you rub it between your fingers, it feels like, um, you know, there's not, nothing outstanding in there that, um, that jumps out at you as being a particle of sand or gravel. And finally, a clay soil, which is the particle size of which is so small that it's not even visible on the scale that I have on the slide here, um, is, is a, a clay, you know, if you put that between your fingers, it's going to feel almost um, silky smooth, maybe perhaps but I'm going to suggest that you could even describe it as being sticky. And, when, and truly, try to think about how that feels when you go out into your soil. Another example for comparison, I've used a basketball all the way down to a, a head of a pin there as a relative size there, which is not even comparable there, not even helpful, but essentially it help you envision if you had a soil particles, if you had a soil that was mostly sand compared to a soil that was mostly clay, which one of those would hold more water? Well, which one would have the most airspace? Which one would have the most available water for plants? Well, if you said clay, you might be wrong because it's going to hold the soil, the water so closely that it's not available to plant. They can't, the pore spaces are too small for the plants to access that water. If you said sandy soil holds most water, you would also be wrong because that drains so quickly, it doesn't hold the water long enough for soil to access. So what we need to do is have a mix of organic matter in the soil to do that. If you have sandy soil, you improve it by adding organic matter. If you have a clay soil, you improve it by adding organic matter simply because you can break up the soil particles. Another really great fun way to, to learn about your soil is to do a little bit of a home soil test. And this is a great activity to do with kids, but just for fun, okay? Take a jar, um, fill it about two thirds full of water, okay? A mason jars work really good, mayonnaise jars, anything with straight sides. Okay, put on about two thirds full of water and add enough soil then to fill the jar, nearly fill the jar. You can add a little pinch of laundry detergent if you want to, to help it, you know, separate well. Shake the jar vigorously, um, very vigorously for quite some time to make sure that all the soil particles are divided and then let it sit. Put it in a place where it won't be disturbed uh, observe the jar over time, over the next couple of days as the particles settle into layers. 
the largest sand particles are going to be the heaviest and they're going to settle down at the bottom. Then above that is going to be your layer of silt. And then above that is going to be a layer of the finest particles, which are clay. Now these are all suspended in water, right? And the clay may stay suspended if there's a heavy clay content for a long time, for multiple days, far longer than the sand and silt settle out. But the sample needs to sit undisturbed to allow the settling to occur. Organic matter in the soil will float or just below the surface of the water level. And you can actually determine what percentage of your soil is sand, salt, and clay by taking the total um, height of the suspended soil solids and dividing it by dividing it into the um, individual quantities, the levels of soil particles to get the percentage of each soil component. And in a minute, we're going to talk about why that percentage is important and how you can use that. Another fun test to do at home is called the soil ribbon test. You grab a handful of your soil, any handful of soil, grab it and, and, and try it with the surface soil and try it with the soil that's down about a shovel full deep. All right. And add water until it makes a ball like putty. If it won't do that at all, if it won't stay into a ball at all, then you have sand. Okay. Start squeezing that ball through your thumb and forefinger to make a ribbon. You're gonna get muddy. It's a fun thing to do with kids, make that ribbon. The longer the ribbon you can get, make without breaking the, without breaking it and letting it fall and breaking it off, will determine how much clay you have in the soil, okay? It gives you some clues. These tests give you some clues to what kind of drainage you have. It gives you clues on what kind of plants will grow well there. And it gives you clues on why certain plants will not grow well there, okay? And the reason we do soil testing, and we'll talk about soil testing in a minute, and these kinds of soil tests too, is that it's far better to select plants which will grow in the soil that you have than to try to change the soil you have to suit the plants you want to grow. So site analysis includes these kinds of things. It's not just sun. It's not just space, it's also about the soil you have underneath that the plants grow in. So the question is always, what's a good soil? And what's a bad soil? The soil texture triangle gives names that are associated with different kinds and combinations of sand, salt, and clay. The coarse textured or sandy soil is one that's composed mostly of very sand sized large particles that are going to drain very quickly. A very fine textured or clayey soil is one that's going to be dominated by the very tiny particles which drain poorly. The particles you can be discharged. You can see here the percentage sand, uh, the percentage clay on the left side, top or right and the percent salt on the upper right, okay? And you read this chart by looking at the percentages, okay? Here on the silt side, can you see my pointer? Um, from 10% all the way up to 100%. And on percent sand from zero up to 100 and percent clay from zero up to 100 here. And you can take that your soil test you did with your water jar, for instance. And if you've determined that you can see you have 30% clay, and you've determined that you have 50% sand, and you can figure out from that soil test you also have perhaps 20% silt we have the places at which those intersecting lines meet is what you can give your label to your, to your soil. But still the question is, what's a good soil? Okay. The question should not be, what's a good soil? What's a bad soil? The question should be, how do we make a soil better? And the areas that are in the, more or less in the center of, these, of this chart are going to be what we would generally consider to be good, healthy, 
plant supporting, microorganism supporting soils. The extremes, of course, sand, silt, and clay lack the ability to some aspect of healthy soils and it's going to make it harder for you to do your work. So let's stop here and talk about um, what's coming up next. We've got soil testing and soil nutrients. Are there any questions right now about soil structure? We have a few, Kirsten. The first question was about lawn aeration. Someone lives in a, a condo and is trying to convince their association to aerate their clay compacted soil. Is that a good idea? And if so, at what kind of intervals? Um, soil compaction is a really very real issue. And I know that places like um, um, the mall in Washington, D.C. that you know, and other places where they get a lot of heavy traffic from just from people walking on it are aerated at least on an annual basis. Soil aeration of lawns can be done on an annual basis without any harm being done. And certainly um, it should be done every couple of years if that's a problem. Keep in mind that the typical aeration techniques that are used on lawns only take out, only aerate about maybe four inches of the top surface of the soil. And it's not bad, but it's better, and it's better than nothing. But remember that plant roots uh, and, and soil for, um, for lawn growth is in the top two to four inches. But your other plants, your, your shrubs, your trees, your, your other plants are going to be have their roots at a much deeper level. And so the soil aeration that takes place uh, that's needed for that kind of optimized plant growth is going to have to be much deeper than what the standard equipment is used for lawn aeration. Okay, thank you. Um... Another uh, participant had a question about using a shallow mantis tiller. Uh, she apparently uses it to weed around shrubs and was worried that that may do harm to the microorganisms or soil layers. Can you advise her? Um, yes, um, I love mantis tillers. I used to use them a lot. Um, I used to use them for preparing soil for planting once the major, the large work was done with, with shovels or pitchforks, I used to use mantis to mix the top layers of soil together. I'm going to say two things about tillers and not mantis in particular, but um, the tilling of soil is not, you know, when you use a tiller, you're mixing the surface of the soil. And we, we love that, it, it, you know, it makes it look, the soil look really good and friable and wonderful to work in, but it, it doesn't get very deep and it always goes to the same depth. So what's happening here is that over time, we are tilling the top six to 12 inches of soil over and over and over again. And when we do that, we create a layer below that 12 inches which could be considered and sometimes develops into what's called a hard pan layer. And a hard pan layer is, is, is a layer which is impervious to water. And so you end up making the problem worse than you would if you had just simply layered your material on top, dug your hole for your plants and left it alone. Um, that is the argument for double digging. Okay, even though it's discredited because it inverts the layers of, of organic matter down into a layer where the plants and microorganisms can't function well, the, the, it does break up those high pan layers. Another problem with using the mantis below your shrubs is, again, because of the presence of the plant roots. And the plant roots there are going to be damaged on the surface by the use of a mechanical tool like that to, um, to, tear, up the, to tear up weeds. So I, I, that's not the practice that I would recommend. Okay, thanks. Um, someone asked, are there any amendments to inoculate soil against disease? They mentioned they were having trouble with septo septoria and their tomatoes. 
Well, septoria is a fungal, uh, fungal disease, um, which is spread at times through the splashing of water. And so if you can mulch the soil, that will help uh, reduce the incidence of splash of the fungal organisms. And if you can remove um, the diseased leaves from the plant, you will also reduce the amount of inoculum in your garden. One important thing to remember is that the, the living soil, a living healthy soil contains microorganisms and even macroorganisms, which actually fight off and help plants with uh, by, 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 by consuming or otherwise displacing, or sometimes even um, actually fighting off the bad organisms which cause disease and injury to plants. So a healthy, diverse landscape planting with healthy soils will help keep your plants healthier too. Thank you. And the final question for this section is about earthworms. This person has heard that some of them are invasive. Should we be encouraging or discouraging earthworms? Well, there is no native earthworm. You know, <laughs> our, what we think of as being earthworms are, are, are imports from Europe. We also have two invasive earthworms, one called hammerhead worm, as well as the jumping worm. Um, which are, have become established in our urban areas. Um, the, the major issue with these, these um, earthworms is that they, they, the good thing about them is that they consume and digest um, organic material and produce um, the, the, the very fine um, particles that go into the soil that help with that glue, you know, that help create those pads that are so healthy in the soil. They also aerate the soil by tunneling through it to, to eat that organic matter. The bad news is that they also eat too much organic matter. And in areas where some of these invasive earthworms have become over-established and, and, and uh, they, they are consuming the organic matter at such a rate that there's nothing left on the surface. This is more of a problem in forests um, where invasive jumping worms have become established. and um, you can help by simply continuing to add organic matter on a regular basis because we're not gonna get rid of the worms. Alrighty, thank you, Kirsten, we can move on. Okay. So um, I'd like to talk to you about um, um, soil testing and soil nutrients next. Uh, this is a picture of my son, um, Thomas Buell's hand, <laughs> uh, holding some soil from his garden. And we have quite a few slides I wanna show you related to his work. So I want to talk here first about adding fertilizer to your soil and what that means. There's a great misconception about adding fertilizer to the soil. People talk about feeding the soil. Well, we're not really feeding this, I'm sorry, feeding the plants. We're not really feeding the plants. We are feeding the microorganisms in the soil. We're providing the micronutrients that are necessary to the function of microorganisms in the soil to be able to, you know, provide the plants with the uh, mineral nutrients that they need. The essential elements of plant growth, which also happen to be the same essential elements that, that humans need, um, include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which come from the air, water, and soil. These are the essential elements. The secondary elements, um, uh, which include phosphorus, potassium, calcium, all the way down to molybdenum, are sourced from the soil and or fertilizer additives that were added to our soils when they are deficient. But this is something that we need to think about as we go through this next section because um, I want you to think about the fact that plants add and create their own food. You'll remember this from high school biology, okay? Um, and I think to, for me, it makes sense to start down here in this lower right corner with the where it says sunlight here and think about photosynthesis. And of course, the 
process of photosynthesis takes water and oxygen and converts it into plant sugars, okay? Sugar, carbohydrates, and oxygen, which are utilized in the respiration process um, to release energy that creates plant growth. Photosynthesis is a process which happens primarily in the daytime. Respiration happens primarily at nighttime. Um, and I'm very, very, very over, over simplifying this, but essentially what I want you to get away from this is that plants make their own food. They need help to, with some of the other ingredients that they require to, 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 be, um, um, to optimize their growth, but essentially they take this sunlight Okay, and water and oxygen and create these sugars, these carbohydrates. And these carbohydrates are the basis behind what produces the plant growth, you know, the, the parts that we eat, the, the fruit, the, the stems, the leaves, um, the, the, the bark, the wood and trees. Okay, this is the action of this, the, the utilization of stored carbohydrates in order to produce plant growth. But keep that in mind as we go through the next section. Soil testing is something that we promote widely. Um, this is done for many reasons. First of all, we, we, we want to save you money, okay? Adding, um, nutrients to soils that don't need it is simply a waste of, of, of money. It's over, it's over fertilization is costly and it can also be damaging to the environment. A soil test provides a snapshot in time that tells part of the story that you can use to um, make economical and ecological decisions about how to maximize your plant growth. Soil test uh, measures soil pH, which refers to the soil acidity, of the, whether it's basic or acid. It measures your major nutrients, including potassium and phosphorus, uh, measures the minor nutrients, um, which are essential for plant growth. And if you opt for it, it will also test your soluble salts and organic matter. The results that are provided to you as a result of these, uh, you know, of the, of a, as a function of the soil test, um, provide you with information about what you should apply in terms of fertilizer, how much you should apply, when you should apply it, and of course, any kind of um, um, modification that you need to make to the pH level of the soil. The soil test kits that can be used to send these soil samples in consist of a box and a form. And these are available at a variety of locations throughout Arlington and Alexandria. And of course, if you are not from our area, your local extension office and even your garden centers will have these types of soil test kits that can be sent into um, either a private lab or a university lab for analysis. The Virginia Tech Soil Testing Lab does not test for anything related to soil contaminants. If you wish to test to, to know about soil contaminants, you have to send that away to a private lab. But this is a really great test for basic, basic information about how to maximize the ideal growing conditions for your gardens. So we laugh about this because this is, um, uh, <laughs> I work for extension. Have you done a soil test? Is kind of how we start conversations. Um, you're going to need to have information about your, your, um, your, your, your identity, how to contact you. You need to know it, how to, um, to, to um, where to send the results to and you're gonna to have to have some information about how to do this. Let's do tips and tricks for getting the most out of your soil test results. Include making sure that your name and email are legible 
and you know, easily readable, and, and that section at the top is complete. I often, often get calls from people, I haven't gotten my soil test results back. And sometimes it's because the email is, is, is illegible or, or um, unreadable. That unit code that's over there on the far right is also important because that will tell the lab where to put the results. And if you call me and say, where, where are my soil test results? I'm gonna ask you, where did you have your soil test done? Where did you get your soil test kit from? Because oftentimes that um, unit code has been pre-filled and is um, um, identifies us as um, your, your locality where under which your soil test results will be found. 013 happens to be the, um, the um, code for Arlington. If you're sending in more than one sample, you need to make sure that you use the sample ID section. The sample ID section allows you to remember and for us to identify which soil test results come from which part of your, which of your samples, okay? If you send in more than one sample, sometimes the, they can get mixed up. That's, that's not good. The plant to be grown code, which is in the middle of the page, is very, very important if you want to have a recommendation for fertilizer applications. And the section that's immediately to the right of that on the form identifies a three digit code for different kinds of crops. And if you don't see exactly what you want to um, grow on that list of crops, you need to choose one that some, has somewhat similar um, growing condition requirements. Um, but the categories include acid loving plants, um, garden vegetables, um, um, lawns, and so on. At the bottom, it asks you to select what kind of test do you want to be conducted. You have three choices. The routine test, routine test is usually enough for almost every purpose. There's also an optional test for organic material, which is interesting, but Suffice to say that if you have a soil that you're gardening in, you can always add more organic matter. And I find that result to be rather meaningless. There's also a test you can do for soluble salts. And the soluble salts test, which is at the very bottom there, is useful if you suspect that you have had a spill of fertilizer or other kind of contamination to your soil. The soil test results are returned to you by email, and uh, it's a very efficient process. And the first thing that's on there that you need to note is that the, the notes and explanations that are put in that upper right-hand box uh, provide you with some additional information that you can use to, to um, augment your knowledge of what they're talking about on the soil test. Those um, soil test notes refer to the specific crop. So test, soil test note number 19 refers to the vegetable gardens. Okay, the nutrient analysis line, which is that line that's uh, um, the, the top line there is going to talk about how much of your uh, major nutrients are available there. Now notice, I have not talked about nitrogen. And this test does not cover your nitrogen levels in your soil. Nitrogen is an essential element of plant growth. And you just need to understand that every year you're going to have to add some form of nitrogen to your soil. The reason it's not tested for is that snapshot in time aspect of this test. Nitrogen is highly volatile. It will not be the same tomorrow as it is today. And if you change it by adding material to it, that's going to, be, that's going to influence the level of nitrogen as well. You can find um, labs that will measure that for you. But again, it's not a very meaningful measurement because it changes rapidly. Nitrogen is constantly being washed out of the atmosphere um, um, from, through the rain. And, and your garden is, supply, is supplied by nitrogen uh, from rainfall and from the air. So just uh, remember that the Virginia Tech test does not test for nitrogen. Secondly, 
you have a line there that rates the relative um, quantity of the particular nutrients for successful plant growth. And the VH stands for very high, H stands for high, medium is for M, and then sufficient, okay? Well, if it's sufficient, it's sufficient. And if your soil test indicates that you have a high, very high or medium levels, chances are you're not going to improve your plant growth by adding more nutrients, okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that you don't have to, to spend money on fertilizer if you have a very high rating. And for instance, exactly that first, not the first uh, nutrient level, which is phosphorus, the P level, that's a great concern to us here in the Chesapeake Bay area. If you, add, if you have a very high or a high level of phosphorus in your soil and you add more to it, there is no way for that soil to hold on to it or utilize that extra load of phosphorus. And what happens next time it rains or do you have any kind of erosion of soil, that phosphorus ends up in our, in our groundwater. The other thing that I find personally to be the very most important information, the very most important information in your soil test is the pH measurement. Well, in this case, in the vegetable garden, it says that these, this, for this test, it's 7.8. What is 7.8? What does that mean? Let's talk about that just for a second on the next couple of slides. Across the top line there, you will see the pH measurement. The pH, again, is a, um, is a measurement of the amount of, of, of available hydrogen in the soil. It measures the hydrogen um, interaction in the soil. 7.0 is considered neutral. neutral. And as the numbers go down from there, 6.5, 6, 5.5, 5.0, 4.5, and so on, you have acid soils. Anything above neutral is considered a base soil or an alkaline soil, and that's fine. What do you do with that information? Well, some plants prefer acid and some plants prefer alkaline soils. And that's um, a great way to start the conversation because I'd like to talk to you about why they prefer those kinds of conditions. If you look at the chart here, you'll see that at neutral, right in the middle of the chart, it's neutral pH of 7.0. If you follow that line all the way down, you will see that the most major nutrient levels are fairly optimal. And the width of the line, for example, on nitrogen, the top red line, the width of the line uh, represents the availability of that, of that nutrient in the soil. Similarly, you can see um, on the line for potassium, the orange line, but very highly acid soils, there is not much available potassium in the soil, but as you get more and more basic, the availability for potassium is optimized. In an opposite way, you can look at the iron, which is the light green line, the first green line down there. At very acid soils, and very acid sour soils, as we used to say, um, iron is optimized. It's the most available at acid soils. But as you go up into alkaline soils to the right, and the soil gets progressively a higher pH, iron becomes limited. Well, one of the problems that's very common with azaleas, for example, is that they develop something called iron deficiency. They develop a, um, um, chlorosis, which is a, a venal yellowing of the veins, okay? In response to iron deficiency. Well, let me tell you that iron is almost never deficient in our soil. What? limits the iron uptake by that plant. If the plant is showing an iron deficiency, it means that it is deficient. It's not getting enough of it, right? Well, azaleas like acid soil. That's what we say, right? What they really like is having a nutrients available at that level, which they need for their optimal growth, okay? Another way of saying this is that if Azaleas are grown in very alkaline soil, they're going to be iron deficient. 
they're grown in acid soil, which is what we what we what they what they love. They're going to have the essential nutrients that they need to do well. Okay, I'm sure there are going to be questions about that, but let's talk. Let me let me hammer home this point here. The soil acidity is the most important indicator of the um, plant the soil chemistry that your plants need. When you talk about um, selecting plants for your landscape, this is the first thing you should be doing is knowing what the soil acidity level is. Yes, you can train soil acidity with some work, but if it's very basic or very acid, you're going to be working at that for an, on an annual basis for a very long time to change it because the soil acidity level at the end of the day is basically informed by the parent rock and the weathering process that goes on with the plants that are native to that area. Let's talk about this in a different way. Here is a sample soil test result um, for lawns. And you can see the crop there in the middle of the page at the bottom. So you can see that the crop on the soil test is lawn maintenance for bluegrass fescue lawns, all right? The Soil pH here is 7.6. And the recommendation from the lab is that no lime is needed. Lime, of course, is a calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate product, which, which supplies um, um, an agent to the soil, which causes the pH to be raised, OK? Calcium carbonate is going to raise the pH of the soil into from acid to alkaline. Okay, remember the higher you go, the more alkaline the soil is. So lawns love to have a, a neutral to slightly basic soil. And this is a pretty basic soil right here at 7.6, basic meaning alkaline soil. No lime is recommended for this. And the recommendations for fertilizer is also very low. Is also made here for a 2 1 1 ratio fertilizer. And by the way, the ratio of fertilizer is NPK. The first number is nitrogen, the second one is potassium, the third one is phosphorus. Sorry, the other way around. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Okay. 2 1 1 fertilizer, um, uh, which is a very low uh, percentage fertilizer. Because look at what it says right above that. It says that the phosphorus levels are low plus and the potassium levels are medium. Everything else is fine. Okay, so we need a little bit of fertilizer here in lawns because they are mowed regularly, need to have a nitrogen source. And by the way, if you're leaving your lawn clippings, you can supply up to one third of the total nitrogen that your lawn needs on an annual basis. It's something to think about. Leave that stuff. Okay, here we have a crop of blueberries. Everybody can read the blueberries crop there. And what does it say here about the pH? The pH says five point. I can't read that myself. Let's see if I can make that bigger. Five point eight. Five point eight. So that's a very acid, isn't it? But it's not acid enough for blueberries. Blueberries want 4.5 to 5.5 um, pH. And so the recommendation that's made for, by the lab is that certainly don't add any lime because we certainly don't need to add that. We do need to add something to lower the pH of the soil. And so aluminum sulfate or um, um, an other form of elemental sulfur is needed. Now there are other forms of sulfur besides aluminum. Okay, and aluminum, um, aluminum compounds um, are, are considered to be somewhat toxic to the soil. And so if you can find rows of sulfur or other kind of elemental sulfur to apply, that will work slowly and safely over a longer period of time to reduce your um, soil acidity. 5.8 needs to be lower. They also recommend a fertilizer because you're Fertilizer levels are lower. Let's look at this one. This is shrubs, non-acid-loving shrubs. The pH is 
And certainly that is way, way too acid and sour, low pH for non-acid loving shrubs. Okay, so the lime recommendation is 27 pounds of agriculture limestone, either ground or pulverized per 100 square feet and applications up to five pounds each. You're going to need to raise that pH for optimal plant growth. Let's look at this one. This is trees. Now, bearing in mind that we do not recommend fertilizer for trees, and certainly if you look at the analysis of the nutrient levels, you don't need to add any fertilizer for this. But the soil pH of 5.5 is pretty low, all right? And so they do recommend adding 11 pounds of agriculture limestone, okay? I hope this is clear that the, that the pH is what I look at, first of all, when I look at the soil test recommendations. Okay, the soil test notes, which I talked about on the first slide when we talked about these, the results that come back from the lab, consist of a series of, of publications that are available for you at the soiltest.dt.edu website. And they're very informative. They are referenced on your soil test kit results and um, are, are well worth reading if you are interested in learning more about how to optimize the growth of these various crops. So you don't have to buy a bag of fertilizer. You can also supply your soil nutrient needs with organic sources. Basically, applying high levels of organic matter throughout the year are going to supply most of your nutrients that you need for your plants, okay? High quality organic matter or organic sources of nutrients are to be preferred. You know you're gonna to have to supply nitrogen annually and you can do that through green manure or any kind of compost. You can apply it through fish meal, soybean seed meal, cotton seed meal. There are lots of sources of organic matter. Even your kitchen waste supplies or nitrogen sources, okay? Um, you can supply it with manure, but you're gonna to have to be very careful with, about that. And the, the, the older it gets, the better it is. If you've got a phosphorus deficiency, adding 10 pounds of bone meal per 100 square feet of rock phosphate is going to be just fine to adding uh, phosphorus to your soil in a safe, natural way. Potassium deficiency, Remember, potassium, by the way, is, is going to be um, what drives the plant's needs for producing fruit and flowers. Phosphorus is the nutrient that is most needed for optimizing your, um, your root growth. Uh, nitrogen, of course, is the nutrient that is most needed for optimizing your um, leaf and stem growth, okay? If you add, by the way, if you add too much nitrogen to your soil, your plant is going to be um, favoring leaf and stem growth as opposed to flower and fruit growth. So it's something to think about. If you've got a calcium deficiency or a magnesium deficiency, you need to add um, limestone um, in one of two forms. You can add it as a calcium, um, formulation, or you can add, add it as a magnesium formulation. Okay, typically we, the recommendation is for a calcium um, supply, and um, but if magnesium is in is in um, deficiency, you need to use a, uh, the, the um, magnesium sulfate recommendations. If you're fertilizing landscape plantings, you remember that your pH of 6.3 to 6.8 is gonna be the optimal level to use, to, to aim for, for the pH. You need to make sure that you add it to the surface, rake it in, uh, or work it into the top level of surface. And remember, most plant roots are in the top 14, no, even the greatest trees are gonna be in the top 14 inches of soil. So take great care when you're disturbing the soil on the surface because those plants, the feeder roots that take in the water and the nutrients from plants are typically right there on the surface, all right? 
If you put, if you need to have lime in, in, in quantities of, of greater than five pounds, you need to divide it up into several applications over a period of time, at least a month apart. And of course, never allow contact with lime or fertilizer directly on plants. Trees and shrubs that typically don't require fertilizer applications and um, the soil exception that I, I would consider would be something like blueberries where you need to maintain a more acid soil. SAIS and so on, the acid levels require some help. Always use a nitrogen source like an organic source or even a, a, a prepackaged fertilizer that is at least 50% wind. What is wind? Wind is water insoluble nitrogen. All right. Obviously, if it's an organic material in, in a, in a uh, compost or other kinds of, of a form like that, it's going to be water insoluble. But if it's in a fertilizer product, a synthetic fertilizer product, water insoluble means that it is coated somehow to to make sure that the release is done over a period of time and not just all at one time dissolved into the uh, groundwater. And of course, apply nitrogen when your plants need it, okay? Plant root growth continues through the winter and a winterizing application of, of um, phosphorus will, will, can sometimes result in good results. But typically we want to fertilize plants when the plants are needing it and when they can most optimize it in during the growing season. House plants and our container plantings, again, are going to require a um, prefer a pH of around 6 to 6.5. And when you over fertilize plants that are in containers, you end up with a problem with the um, fertilizer salts accumulating in the plant tissues, and that can result in the ends of the leaves dying. Okay, and that's because the the, the soil is, is is a finite amount, and it's contained within a, in, in the pot. You're going to have to make sure that you pay attention to how much fertilizer you put down on that. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Pot and mixes, um, commercial pot and mixes are desirable because they provide both drainage and water retention, but you can mix, mix your own. And there are many recipes online for various components and most people who are experienced with this have their own favorite mix of ingredients that optimize um, their own plant growth, all right? You will need to, to maintain that pH by using um, lime application, small amounts of lime application, Make sure you moisten the soil, water in well if you're adding fertilizer. And because potted plants are continuously being, having nutrients leached out of the soil, you're going to have to repeat fertilization on a regular basis. Always read the label. And I wanna talk about this real quick before we go on about the soil structure that is in containers. Um, when we put soil into a pot, the picture on the left side shows a typical pot um, that maintains plant growth in the top two thirds of it. The bottom of it um, is, is going to have a much higher level of moisture in the bottom than it has in the rest of the soil. And that's because as the water goes down to the bottom of the pot and it hits those holes, even though you have drainage holes in it, there is a differential in pressure between the water, uh, uh, a differential in the water holding capacity of the soil that's at the bottom of that pot and where it wants to go out into the air. The soil at the bottom of the pot is going to hold onto that moisture as long as it possibly can, okay? And that's why when we put gravel in the bottom of the pot, we are creating, we are moving that, that, that line of that differential um, line of, of, of moisture content and air, quant air uh, pore levels higher in the pot. The water doesn't want to run into that um, larger, less friendly, so to speak, layer of gravel or stones at the bottom of the pot or even into the air. It wants to stay and it will be held tightly by the soil that's right above that layer, whether it's sitting on the pavement or at the bottom of the pot or whether it's sitting on top of a layer of gravel. 
This is why we end up with plant problems sometimes in pots because the bottom of this pot, there's insufficient area for, for root growth and the bottom of the pot is always wetter than the top. So make sure that you have a soil column that goes all the way down to the bottom of your pot. And this is a, a different way of thinking about drainage out of containers. So that, that gravel layer at the bottom is not being helpful. Uh, try to um, make the soil go all the way down to the bottom and you'll have much better, um, a larger area for, plant, for healthy plant growth inside your containers. So finally here, um, just a little more ads here. Healthy soil grows healthy plants. I can talk to people all day long about healthy plants, but if they understand that healthy soil is the basis of that and that healthy plants are going to make their lives, people's lives better, either because they're eating healthier plants or be, you know, the produce from healthier plants or because um, healthier plants produce uh, a healthier environment for us to live in, then we can begin to talk about health, so healthy soil. All right. Okay, let's talk about uh, any questions real quick here about any soil nutrients. Alrighty, we have a gardener who has a soil pH of 7.5 and wants to grow nightshades. They asked about short and long-term steps to boost their success. What, 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 does, what, does wants, what wants to be grown in that? Nightshade vegetables. Oh, tomatoes, peppers. Yes. Um, Solanaceae family plants. Yes. Well, these plants are going to require almost a basic soil. And so from a long term perspective, I think that you're, you're on the right track. You know, most plants are gonna do, opt, be, the most nutrients are gonna be optimized at a 6.5 to 6.8 pH range. That's, you know, if you do nothing else, that's where you need to be. So uh, for solanaceous plants, I think that we're looking at all the way up to basic, maybe 7.1 at the most. Um, but again, the, the, the plant growth is gonna be maintained at 6.5 to 6.8. Long-term, the best you can do is to add organic matter because the organic matter will buffer soil changes, soil chemistry changes. So once you get the pH correct, that organic matter is going to help maintain that pH for you. Okay. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Colleen. Thank you for that. Um, there were two amendments. People asked questions about what are they and how do you use them? One was green sand and one was worm castings. Okay, green sand is a, is a, is a, a phosphorus um, um, source and you can simply use it as a soil amendment. Um, you will have to do some reading of the label to determine or the literature to determine how much green sand to add to accomplish the desired um, levels of phosphorus in your soil. Okay, I, I don't know what that, what that ratio is right now. Um, worm castings are, are also available for commercially to purchase as a soil amendment. They are probably impractical to, to add um, to a large garden, but for a container garden, they would be very useful for improving the soil structure. Uh, worm castings um, contain uh, uh, that can, can help to build um, the pads of the soil and will improve soil structure simply by integrating um, that gelatinous um, uh, material to the, to the soil of your container. Okay. Um, someone was worried, is there a time to fertilize plants beyond which it's no good or can you fertilize any time or is it sometimes too late? Um, it depends um, on the crop that you're growing. So as I mentioned earlier, you want to fertilize, first of all, to the results of a soil test. If your soil test says that you have high or very high or even medium levels of nutrient in your crop, adding more is not going to make your crop grow better. All right, this is an important idea to remember that um, adding more nutrients on an annual basis simply because that's what your father did and what your grandfather did and because you've done it every year 
it is potentially a waste of money as well as a danger to the environment, okay? And our water sources need us to be vigilant about how much nutrients we add to the soil. But do a soil test once every three years, just to make sure that you are not overdoing it. Why add nutrients that you don't need? So again, the, uh, the applied nutrients when the plants need it is the best rule of thumb. For instance, if you are applying, uh, if you have a vegetable garden, certainly add organic matter to the soil in the fall to get it ready for the springtime is a good practice. And the insoluble nitrogen, the, nitrogen, the, the non volatile nutrients will be still be there in the springtime. But adding nitrogen in the fall for a vegetable garden that's going to be grown in the springtime is a waste of money. Okay? You, your nitrogen source is not stable in the soil. It will be there short term for plants to use it when they need it. So you should add nitrogen, for example, in the spring as you are planting your crop. And again, in the summertime for a boost of um, late summer nutrients that keep your crop growing. Lawns are also in a similar way, uh, depending on what kind of lawn grass you have, cool season grasses need to have the majority of their fertilizer applied in the fall. Two thirds of the fertilizer gets applied in the fall, one third in the springtime when the crop needs it. Warm season grasses like zoysia or Bermuda grass are going to need the majority of their nutrients applied in the summertime, okay? Because that's on the, on the time leading up to the period of most rapid growth. So it's important to understand your crop that you're growing and what its nutrients needs are. Excellent. Uh, could you comment on the use of compost tea? Okay, compost tea, um, there are various thoughts about compost tea. Um, essentially what compost tea is, is um, um, taking um, compost or even manure sometimes, throwing it in a bucket or a container and saturating it with water so that you can take that water. The theory is that the nutrients that are in the compost or manure are put into the water and then when you water your plants using that material, um, those nutrients are conveyed. I, I think that it's, it's, um, it can be useful for very young plants, um, for seedlings. Uh, beyond that, I think that you're just as well mixing the compost up with the soil. Okay. Uh, someone dug a, a rain garden and is moving the soil to another location in their yard. Two questions. Should they mix that soil in with the underlying soil? Should they put leaf mold into it before they put it down or should they put leaf mold on top? Wow. Um, so the question revolves around removing soil from an area where rain garden is going in and then taking that away to another part of the ground. Essentially, you are taking a, an underlayer of soil um, out of this area that you are excavating and putting it on top of soil elsewhere, which has, um, which, which is a, a normal top layer. Um, if you have the space available, um, I would take that soil and put it somewhere for a year or so where you can amend it with um, organic matter and allow it to become um, enriched by uh, the microorganisms that are not totally devoid you know, as it is an under layer of soil. If it's merely topsoil you're moving and you're not getting too much into the subsoil below the surface, then I would say you're in fine shape. And if you're not um, covering over plant roots um, significantly, you can spread it right on the surface of the soil. And this is another, brings up another point, which is that I see many plants that are in very sad condition because mulch has been applied over the top of the roots or even soil has been over, added over the top of the roots or they've been planted too deeply. And what happens is that the, um, the increased volume of soil over the top of the plant roots changes the, 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 um, the air and water content of the soils that the plants are growing in. 
All right, and what happens then is that the plant either, those, those roots essentially begin to deteriorate and the plant responds by putting another level of roots out sometimes into that overlayer of soil or mulch. And this is a whole nother presentation, but you need to look at root flares. Uh, maybe somebody can put that in the chat box and, and make sure that the point at which the trunk of the tree or shrub and the roots of the um, shrub or tree take off are planted at or above the layer of soil that we would call the top, okay? Um, anytime you see that trunk going straight down into the soil with, uh, with no flaring of the trunk at the base, it's an indicator that the plant is planted too deeply. And it's often an explanation for why they are doing poorly. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. I think we can move on to the next section. Okay. All right, we're running behind a little bit. We're gonna go through this case study very quickly. How to get healthy soil. The ideal microbial diet of the, of the organic matter that's in the soil is gonna be a 24 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, all right? All organic matter has a carbon to nitrogen ratio, okay? You can see the extremes here, rye straw. If you put straw on your, your beds or in your compost, you know that you've got an, about an 80 to one ratio of carbon material, brown material to uh, nitrogen or green material ratio. If you look at the other extreme of soil microbes, they're gonna be, the, the microbes themselves as organic beings have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of eight to one. I want you to also look at the, um, the idea of uh, wood chips. Well, wood chips, have a ratio of something like 400 to one, carbon to, to nitrogen. And this is gonna be really important as we go through this next section, talking about what happens with my son's soil in North Carolina, okay? So as you look at this list here, you can, you can get an idea for how we can optimize the use of, of, of ground, cover crops, like grass or alfalfa to add nutrients to the soil, which are right there and all ready to go and match the ideal microbial diet of 24 to one. If we use something like manure, um, which has a much higher um, uh, ratio, much uh, lower ratio, I suppose, of carbon to nitrogen, we're gonna have to add more carbon to it to bring it up to the level that microbial diets prefer. If we're using rye straw, oat straw, corn material, or things like that that have a very high carbon content, we're going to have to add more nitrogen to bring that down to the ideal microbial diet in the decomposed material. So the picture on the left uh, is inverted. It's upside down because I, I thought it would make more sense to show this to you that way instead of the right way up. But this is a soil profile of what my son started with in North Carolina. You can see the organic matter on the top. You can see the subsoil below that, which is a heavy iron-based clay soil. And below that, you've got a really awful stuff with rock and sand and awful stuff down there. Heavy, heavy soil that's, that's, that's um, well, let's say it was not good for growing stuff in. Um, he likes gardening for the sake of gardening. And in 2016, he was so proud of his little collection of kale um, that he had to show it off. Okay. In September of 2017, he moved into a new um, uh, um, landscape, a new, a new property. And this is what his first year's garden looked like. And you can see the puddling of the, the effect of the puddling on top of the water where rain had not permeated the soil very quickly. Um, the light areas um, show areas of very low, high sand level and, and very low organic matter. And, um, and of course the plant material looks less than ideal there. Well, why is that? Because when he tilled it up, he had a very, very um, um, 
poor soil, very low in organic matter, very high in rocky sand and clay. And this is what he started with, okay? And he, what he was still contending with, um, even long after he had started to garden, you can see the poor little bean seeds coming up. He was so proud of his bean seeds coming up there. Um, July of 2018, he still had the bad soil and he's complaining about how many weeds he has. The weeds are outcompeting his, his vegetable crops because that's what they can survive in. All right, notice the gravel, notice the sand, notice the poor, um, poor color of the soil and so on. He was very proud of his, 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 his okra, uh, which I think would grow in very poor soils if we gave it to him. But everything else looks pretty poor. Now, what else is going on here is that he has a very poorly drained yard. And in heavy torrential rains of June of 2020, his garden was underwater. The reason for that is that 12 inches down below the surface, he has a layer of compacted sand and clay. It is um, a, a, a rather unique situation that water just sat on top of and took its sweet time running through. But he complained to me about not being able to grow his vegetables he wanted to grow. And I said, well, if you're gonna keep your garden there, you're gonna to have to raise it up. And he said, what do I raise it up with? And he said, I can't get any soil. And I said, try, you've got chicken farmers around here. You've got uh, all kinds of sources of organic matter. He said, I, uh, he said, I don't wanna do that. So I said, how about wood chips? And in um, the fall of 2020, he commenced to, uh, 2019 maybe, he actually got a couple of people to drop their loads of wood chips, arborist wood chips here on his property. And we started raising up the levels of his soil. Remember, wood chips are about 400 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. And we needed to get it down to 30 to one. So, he started building the soil with wood chips and build up and up. We probably have at this point added close to about two feet of soil um, to, by adding wood chips and allowing it to decompose. Now this is a very quick time frame. All right, we've created furrows, and you notice between the rows of uh, the wide rows we have deeper um, channels of pathways. We actually excavated soil from those pathways, put it on top of the, uh, the wide rows, and then filled those furrows up with wood chips that could break down over time. This is what it looked like in October of 2020, where we continued to add more and more material to, um, to his, his garden area. Wood chips, and it looked like wood chips, and it was mostly pine wood chips, okay? So I was worried about soil acidity. but. Here's what it looked like in March of 2021. Notice that the fence around it, we raised it up by about 18 inches of wood chips. The soil that has been below this, the level has been thrown on top. We have um, uh, worked it in. I gave him a broad fork for Christmas and he loves that beast of a thing. And he notices that when he uses that broad fork, when he first started using that broad fork, that the soil below the layer that he was breaking up was anaerobic and that anaerobic soil smelled bad. It had a lot of water in it, it had a lot of clay in it and breaking it up and putting it up on top of the level of soil of wood chips helped to provide um, um, some organic matter for uh, mixing that in. March of 2021, here we have May of 2021 on the left side, July of 2020, look at the soil, look at the quality of the soil that now I have to admit to you that he used um, kitchen waste on top of that to supply nitrogen. He also used a nitrogen source, um, you know, bad fertilizer to help break down the wood chips in the soil. And this is an important thing to remember that when we add things like wood chips to soils that have a high carbon ratio, the decomposition of that material requires nitrogen, okay? This is how compost works. And in the decomposition process, 
if there is insufficient nitrogen coming from the atmosphere or from some outside source, the nitrogen is going to be taken from the available um, nitrogen soil that the plants would otherwise have to draw on. And so something important to remember is that if you are working with soils that have a high organic matter that has not been turned into a stable um, humus material, which, which is, is already broken down, you're going to have to um, be aware that nitrogen is going to be deficient in your soils with, with a heavy carbon material content. So this is his most recent haul of um, kale. <laughs> He's gone from one bunch or two to boxes and boxes of kale that he loves to donate to the food bank. And so um, this is my gardening buddy. So we're in the home stretch now. And if we don't have a lot of questions, Colleen, I'm just gonna keep on going. You can keep on going. Okay, all right. So I want to encourage you to visit the Organic Vegetable Garden. This is a demonstration garden that's maintained by Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia at the Potomac Overlook Regional Park. And it's a gorgeous garden. It has many fine techniques to observe. Um, in this instance, this is a November picture showing the hoop houses and the covers and the cover crops that are used to help, um, that are done in, to overwinter um, the plants in that garden. Virginia Tech has entered into a partnership uh, with a number of other agencies to help raise awareness about soil. Um, four lines, 12 words, best practices that you can remember. Keep the soil covered, minimize soil disturbance, maximize living roots in the soil, and energize with diversity. These are the four tactics that you can employ, anybody can employ in their landscapes that are under your control. Avoid soil compaction. Remember the pads. That's your rallying cry, okay? Keep the bare ground covered. Use wood chips to cushion ground from heavy equipment. Add organic matter on an annual basis so that you are encouraging the formation of good soil structure, okay? Energize with diversity. Plant more and different kinds of plants. This is a picture from the community garden sign at Glen Carlin Library in Arlington County. The, again, this is another demonstration garden that is maintained by the Extension Master Gardeners of Arlington and Alexandria. A beautiful, beautiful garden in the heart of Arlington County, which has tremendous plant diversity. Uh, another place to observe what plant diversity means is to go to American University in Washington, D.C. and walk the ground, a gorgeous garden. They have cut back tremendously on the um, um, synthetic pest control products simply by diversifying the landscape plantings. Minimize soil disturbance. Uh, again, protect the soil from heavy equipment. You can put down six inches of wood chips over the top of the ground um, to, if you have heavy equipment coming over to to uh, work on an area. That will cushion the ground, cushion the, and prevent soil compaction. Um, consider converting your garden spaces to raised, bed, raised beds or even contain, container type gardens to uh, encourage the, um, the preservation of natural soil structure underneath. Um, reduce tillage and soil disturbance simply by doing lasagna gardening and doing layering over the top of the ground using the materials that will help build soil that you can plant directly in. And always, always cover the soil with some kind of plants or mulch to prevent soil compaction simply from rain. Fertilize always, always to a soil test. If you haven't done a soil test in recent years, uh, we recommend that you do it every two to three years. Um, think about plant nutrients in terms of feeding the microorganisms. The plants don't need our help, the microorganisms do, and these microorganisms are what's gonna support your plant. Make sure that you are not fighting nature by planting plants that require um, special conditions in areas where, they won't, where you don't have those conditions. If you want to have acid-loving plants, make sure that those acid-loving plants go into an area where you have acid soil and where you can maintain acid soil. 
blueberries, for example, are very popular, but it's very hard to maintain a pH of 4.5. Compost and recycle your yard and kitchen waste. Not only will that help um, reduce the amount of waste that's going into our local um, waste management efforts, but it will improve your soil by adding carbonaceous and nitrogenous material to directly back to the ground. If you can get grass clippings from your neighbor who's not using herbicide, they make excellent mulch and, and uh, nitrogen additives to your soil. If you can get wood chips for free, the arborists are happy to drop them off and let, them have you, let you have them. But keep in mind, they're usually very large loads that need to be shared to, for quick use. Keep your leaves, leave the leaves on your ground, leave the leaves in your native areas, collect them in areas where they can be allowed to break down without blowing, build a fence around your garden so you can simply fill it with leaves and let it break down over the summer, over the winter. Improve soil drainage, test your soil drainage capacity. This is a low tech, easy way to check your soil drainage capacity. Dig a 12 inch hole, fill it with water. And then when that drains out, refill it again and measure how long it takes the water level to drop. If you've got less than two inches per hour, if that water is still in that hole the next day, you've got to do something to improve the drainage capacity of your soil or simply take that into account when you are planting. So there's lots of good reasons to work to build healthy soil. Uh, water retention for me is a big one because I don't like to go out and water every day, okay? But it also slows the water runoff. It increases the nutrient exchange capacity of the soil, makes the more nutrients more available. Um, it, it increases the buffering and the, uh, the capacity, which means that we don't, the soil won't change so rapidly. Um, this is important for pH as well as nutrient maintenance. And of course, um, building healthy soil is something we can do to supply the, and, and support the very base of our ecosystem, okay? That healthy soil supports the microorganisms which support the larger macroorganisms that live in the soil which provide food to reptiles, birds, and many other creatures. Finally, the Extension Master Gardeners are a fabulous organization of volunteers that are trained uh, initially and then retrained annually um, to maintain the certification. Our, our units serve both Arlington and Alexandria, but there are units in Loudoun, there are units in, in all around us, Prince William, there's two units in Fairfax County, um, and no matter where you're from, there's probably a master gardener unit close to you. This is a, an extension program that has been in operation since the 19, 1980 or so. The help desk locally is operating still only by email, Master Gardens of Arlington, Alexandria, M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com. You can send us pictures, you can send us questions, you can send us um, bug identification questions, almost anything you can think of, we can help you out with that. And the good news is that starting on the second week of September, the Farrington Community Center where we operate the help desk will be open again to limited public access. We do have plant clinics in operation already that are at, um, already at the um, um, Arlington Courthouse Farmer's Market and at the Alexandria um, well, uh, Old Town Farmer's Market, as well as at the Delray Farmer's Market in Alexandria. These are all on Saturday mornings. Public education classes, thank you for coming today. And we have had a really great time. Demonstration gardens are open to, for public viewing on a regular basis. And of course, there's tremendous, tremendous resources available at mgnv.org, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia.org website. And that's all I have today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Kirsten. That was wonderful. We all learned a lot about soil health. And I wanted to tell you, we just got a thank you from someone in Serbia. <laughs> really? How yeah. wonderful is that? How wonderful is that? Okay, take care.